Well, one of my favorite jokes is not really jokes at all. It's real church bulletin bloopers. These are not jokes. These are mistakes that are found in bulletin bloopers. Sometimes they're not really a mistake, but the person who wrote it wasn't thinking clearly about what the people meant by it, all right? And some of them are typo errors. But let me give you an example. Blooper number one. Due to the minister's illness, Wednesday's healing services will be discontinued until further notice. What faith. Super faith. Bulletin number two. Potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. That must be a Mexican buffet right there. <laughs> now, I like this one. No typo errors, just they weren't thinking. Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. Please use large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> and here's one. This is a typo. Ushers will eat latecomers. <laughs> you better be here on time. You're for dinner. Here's another one. The church will host an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. You know, I, I, at least I appreciate their gracious and their hostility toward me. And then finally, Tuesday at 4 p.m., there will be an ice cream social. All ladies giving milk will please come early. They weren't thinking on that one. <laughs> All right. All right. How many of y'all brought your Bibles? Lift them up real high. Make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Say this. Say, this is my Bible. It is the word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert. My heart is receptive and my cell phone is off, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, turn to someone, look him straight in the eye and say, did you hear that, child of God? I will never, ever, ever be the same again. Well, God bless you. Great to see this large crowd today. We appreciate you coming out. I have a very special message that the Lord put on my heart on Monday. The Holy Spirit took me over, and I was just enveloped in his presence. I was as close to heaven as I possibly can be. And as he began to minister to me, I knew he was giving me the message for these next three Sundays. So I hope you don't miss any of them. I want to read a couple of scriptures to save time. You don't need to turn to it this time. But look up on the big screen. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, from the NIV 84 edition. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now, underscore that phrase, measure of faith. If faith can be measured, there is a quantity to how much faith you can have. You can have a little or a lot. Well, if you don't know that, consider 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. The King James Version. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth. Can y'all say faith groweth? Groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So your faith can grow. Well, that ties together the idea that faith can be measured. Now, I brought from my house a two-cup measuring cup. We all know that when you're making meals, they'll tell you get a, a half a cup, a third of a cup, two cups. You're measuring. Well, faith can be measured. This is you. This is your heart. This is an illustration of your heart. And when you don't know Jesus, guess how much faith you have? Zero. You have no faith. And the Bible talks about those with no faith. Jesus said, why do you have no faith? He told his apostles at one time. Then Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. 
Why do you worry about what you eat and drink? So listen, if you spend a lot of time worrying over little things like eating and drinking, you have little faith. Now, do you have faith? Yeah, it's a little. Then the Bible talks about weak faith. Romans chapter 12. People with weak faith, they're constantly struggling with a lot of guilt. They're feeling guilty about their Christian walk all the time. That's weak faith. Then the Bible describes great faith. Two people in the Bible are described as having great faith. That word great is where we get the word mega from. It's mega faith. Then we're told in Romans 4, Abraham was strong in faith. So there is faith that's strong, not weak. So this is a faith that stands strong in the midst of trials. Then we're told in Acts chapter 6, Stephen was a man full of faith. He had a lot of faith. Faith can be measured. I just want you to see faith is measurable. So a lot of times people think, well, I have faith. Why didn't God help me? Well, the trouble is you didn't have the right amount of faith. Now, somebody might say to me, well, wait a minute, Bishop. Didn't Jesus say if we had faith even as small as a mustard seed, we can say to a mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and it will obey us? Yes, he did. But Jesus was not advocating and encouraging us to have small faith. What he was really doing is he was trying to take away our excuses for not living the way God wants us to live. Well, but you know, I don't know that much about Jesus. Lord, how can I witness to people? Jesus said, don't worry. You have enough faith to tell people about Jesus. Lord, I don't have that much faith. I don't think my prayers will be heard. You pray boldly to the throne of grace. In other words, he's getting rid of our excuses. That's what he meant. People who are always excusing themselves. Well, I just don't have that much faith. But I want you to see faith is measurable. But now, go back to Romans 12, 3 again. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, how did we get the initial measure of faith? And when he says every man, he's dealt to every man, every one of you, he's referring to every one of you believers, not unbelievers, but every one believers. Because what? We heard the gospel. And what was the gospel? God loves you. You're sinners, but Christ came to die for your sins. And if you will receive him into your life, then you will get born again. How many of you all have believed that part of the gospel? Right? And so when you believe that part of the gospel, guess what happened? That gospel put faith in your heart. And this is you. This is every Christian, regardless of where they are in life, this is everyone. We all have faith if we're a believer. We believe in Jesus Christ. So we may not know a lot of what we believe. We may have incorrect beliefs about different things, but we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe he died on the cross for our sins and we received him into our life. That's all it takes to have faith to be saved. By grace are we saved through faith. But this is the measure of faith. But how many of you all know there's a lot more that you can fill your heart with? There's still a lot measurement. There's still faith that you can grow into. Because the more you grow in faith, the more blessings you experience. The more health you experience. The more prosperity and peace and joy and strength. You have better days because your faith is increased. So it is incumbent that we increase this faith. So many Christians, they're stuck at this place, measure of faith. But they're missing out on all God's blessings. Now, in this life. Now, in the life to come, this is all it takes to go to heaven. When you die, you enter heaven. But God has a lot of heaven on earth for you. But you're not going to get heaven on earth if you just live on this measure of faith. You need to grow this measurement. But how do you grow this measurement? Well, just like you believe certain facts about Jesus, you now need to increase your knowledge about who you are and who God is to you. So we're going to talk about the seven steps to getting your faith full. How many of you all are ready for these seven steps? You're ready to take these. The first step is you need to have a revelation of God's word, the reality of the integrity of God's word. God cannot lie that the Bible is God speaking to you. You can trust in it. If God made you a promise, he's going to keep it. You're going to believe that God's word is real. See, a lot of people believe in Jesus, but they have a lot of doubt in the Bible. But see, you need to have confidence that the Bible is God's love letters to you. 
It's his message to you right now, and it's alive and speaking to you. And when you have a revelation of the integrity of God's word, God cannot lie, then guess what happens? That revelation fills your heart with more faith. Then you add to it a revelation of your redemption. You know the reality of your redemption. You are set free from the curse of the law. You're set free from the power of Satan. Sickness and disease is broken from your life. Poverty is no longer to be your master. You are redeemed. And when you have a revelation of your redemption, then what happens? Your heart gets filled with greater faith. Then you get a third step. The revelation that you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You used to be a sinner, but you're now a new creation. You are born again. You have the life and nature of God inside of your spirit. And when you have that revelation, my goodness, it fills your heart more with faith. But then, I love this one. You need to have a revelation that you are the righteousness of God. God doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as a saint. Come on, you don't need to wait for Vatican to approve of you as a saint. God's already approved of you as a saint. You are the righteousness of God. God doesn't look at your sins anymore. And now you have a revelation that I am the righteousness of God. Then, oh, friend, you discover, yes, God is in heaven, but God's also inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit and you have power and fruit and grace you have ability that you did not normally have. And when you got a revelation of the greater one in you and you become God inside minded, woo, that revelation begins to fill your heart. And then friend, oh, when you start to know your authority in the name of Jesus, that when you speak Jesus name, it's as though Jesus is speaking through you. You have the authority through Christ's name. And when you get that authority, woo, are, you, are you seeing what's happening to you right now? You're getting a revelation. Your, your, your faith is growing. But friend, we're going to finish off with the final seventh step. And that is you have a blood covenant with God. Do you understand what it means to have a blood covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ? You take it every Sunday. It's called communion. Do you understand why the church does it all the time? Because this is a revelation that you have a covenant. You are an heir of God. And when you get that revelation, all of a sudden, your heart gets flooded. It's full in Jesus' name. How many of you are ready for these seven steps? Are you ready to take these seven steps with me as you enter into a great understanding of your redemption of the name of Jesus, the word of God, the integrity, okay? So join me for these next three Sundays as we begin to look at these revelations in a little bit better light, okay? So let's look at the first revelation. Know the reality of the integrity of of God's word. Know the reality of the integrity. What does integrity mean? That means when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. When God says this is what's right, you know that's right, even if the Supreme Court says it's wrong. Whatever God says, you know he's telling the truth. It's the integrity of God's word. So the action step, this is what you have to do then to build this faith. Is ready? Act like God cannot lie. He cannot lie to you. Others may lie to you, but God will not lie to you. So what is it? We're, it's the integrity of God's word. That means we have to believe that God's word is with us now. And this Bible that you hold, this is God's connection to you. This is his word to you. See, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And who is he? He's Romans, I mean, John chapter 1, verse 12. He's the word of God made flesh. You see, Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. But then Jesus left heaven because he had to accomplish something else. And so the Holy Spirit came to do what? To continue the teachings of Christ. So what do we have? See, we don't see Jesus in the flesh right now. He's not here to give us his message. He's in heaven. But there is someone who is here, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit did something. He inspired the apostles to write the gospel so we have the message of Christ, but then the apostles had to write the epistles, 
which was a continuation of Jesus' teaching that he did not conclude while on earth. You see, Jesus had much more to teach. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to the apostles, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So Jesus is saying, I finish everything I can say right now. But the Holy Spirit will come and fin finish it. So in our Bible, we have two sections of the New Testament. The Gospels, which is what Jesus taught on earth. And the epistles, what the Holy Spirit continued to teach through Christ or through the, uh, through, uh, the Holy Spirit by Christ. And it was pinned. So when we want to hear from Jesus... We open up the Bible and read it. In the Old Testament, God spoke in various ways through prophets. And what, that's what we have in the Old Testament. We have the writings of prophets. They heard God speak and they wrote down what God spoke. And that's what we have in the Old Testament is what God has spoken. But now we have a greater revelation. God has come himself, the word flesh, to give us the message. But we're not privileged to have seen Christ in the flesh, but no problem. God has given us his word. See, this Bible takes the place of the risen Christ. Your connection to God is a connection with the Bible. You want to hear from God's voice? Pick up your Bible and open it and read it, and God will be speaking to you from the book. You will not know God outside of the book. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is God to you. You want to fellowship with God? Then fellowship with His Word, because His Word and Himself are one of the same. This is your connection to God. This is how you know His thoughts. So that means, in fact, we find this concept being given to us in the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 1, we find seven times God creates the world by speaking. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And evening and the morning was the first day. And God said, that was the second day, and God said, the third day. God said the fourth day. God said the fifth day. God said the sixth day, and he concluded the end of the sixth day, and God said, let us make man after our image. Why does the Bible underscore the fact that God is speaking? Because he's telling us he's not a silent God. He's a talking God. And if he's a talking God, he's a creator God that wants to reveal himself to you because that's how we know someone is by conversing with them. You took your, your, your wife on her first date. How did you get to know her? You talked to each other. It is through that talking that you communicated with each other. You knew what you thought. She, you know how she believes. You know her politics. You know her philosophies. You know her experiences. You know her more because of your communication. So God is letting us know He's a communicating God. He's not a silent God. So if God talked in the, by creating the worlds, he's saying, I'm going to continue talking. And he did. He talked to people who we call the uh, prophets. And we have the Old Testament called the prophets' writings. But then he talked to us personally through Jesus Christ, who's the word made flesh. And we have there the gospels. But now he continues to talk to us through the apostles, and we have their epistles. So what we have now is, in a nutshell, God's talking words to us. This is your contact with God. So you cannot grow in your faith if you have doubts about the Bible. See, to reject the Bible is to reject God's word for today. Just as people rejected the prophets of old and stoned some of them, just as people rejected Jesus Christ, and just as some rejected the apostles and had them martyred, so today people reject the Bible and they become the, the killers, the murderers 
of the Old Testament prophets, the murders of Jesus, the murders of the apostles. Because when you reject God's written word, you've rejected God himself. How can you grow in faith if you reject God's present revelation to you? So this book is the revelation. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do you increase your faith? You have to hear God's word. So that means God initiates by coming to us and giving us a revelation of himself. See, all man-made religions are is man's attempt to try to reach God. But God says, I'm going to come and reach you. I did not use you to create the world. I spoke it and you were not there. And God says, I will reveal myself to you. I will speak when I want to speak and I will show you. Jesus said it this way. No one can come to the father except that the father draws him. God must initiate all truth. And in Christianity and in Judaism, God came to the prophets. They did not come to God. God came to them. Do you see this? They weren't trying to reach God. God reached them. And we did not reach for Christ and bring him down. He came down of his own accord. He reached us. We did not plead for the Holy Spirit to come, but he came to us. Do you see this? All revelation, God must initiate. That's why all false religions is man's attempt to hear God. But God says, I'll take care of that myself. I'll speak to the human race. And he has. And that's the Bible. So if you want to grow in faith, you must grow in your knowledge of the Bible. You can't say, oh, Bishop, I have all the faith in the world, but I don't really know the Bible that much. Then you have just lied. So get on your knees and repent right now. Because you cannot have great faith without the knowledge of the scriptures. It is the Holy Bible. It's the Holy Book. God speaks to us. But let's get practical on this. Go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Let's look at verse 18. Give you a quick story. Abraham has just been promised by God to have a child from his old wife, Sarah. She's very old. She's past childbearing years. They, she hasn't even been able to bear children when she was young. And now she's old. God says, I'm going to still cause her to get pregnant. And through him will be the salvation of the world. How's Abraham going to believe this? But listen to what the Bible says. Verse 18, Romans 4, verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. You are watching The Bondage Breaker with Bishop Tom Brown. To receive today's message in its entirety, call us now, 915-855-9673. Bishop Brown's ministry of spiritual deliverance is well known in America and around the world. His message of freedom and victory in Christ is found in his best-selling books. Come by Word of Life Church for an autographed copy. Word of Life Church has a first-class children's ministry. Children also get to enjoy one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the city. Here at Word of Life Church, your teenagers will feel like they are a part of a group of youth that are truly committed to Christ. You won't find better music anywhere in El Paso than by our church band, as they play the latest music while incorporating the great classical hymns. Fellowship is important to us, so we have provided a relaxing atmosphere in our expanded coffee shop while you make new friends. Word of Life Church believes in helping those in need. Word of Life quietly helps provide food, clothing, and aid to the needy. 
Visit us at Word of Life Church and make a positive difference, not only in your own life, but the lives of others. Word of Life Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for Spanish. Bible study is on Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. The church meets at 11675 Pratt Avenue. That's near the intersection of Pebble Hills and Saul Kleinfeld across from Walmart. For more information about this spirit-filled church, call us now 915-855-9673.